Hey, morning, everyone. Um, I got to say, I thought this place was going to be a ghost town. So thanks for showing up. Um, so we're here to talk about why enterprises want containers now, um, and maybe why you should too. And we'll go through uh, a few different things that we've learned kind of along the way here. Um, so my name is Spencer Smith. I am a cloud engineer at Selenia. I've been working there for a couple years now. Um, I've been focused on doing cloud automation tooling, um, as well as kind of lately the past year or so doing container container workloads, um, getting our clients into Kubernetes and, and that kind of thing. Um, and I've got Will with me, who I'll let introduce himself. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Will. I've been working at Selenia a couple of years now. Um, I help uh, with uh, DevOps, continuous integration, working with a number of clients, helping them streamline their processes and get software out the door faster. Quick, quick little blurb here about Selenia here. Uh, we've been around since 2013. Uh, we've been helping people adopt cloud technologies, and more recently, we've been doing uh, a lot of container work, uh, especially with Kubernetes, Docker, and um, a, lot of, a lot of CI, CD stuff out there as well. So back to Spencer here. Cool, so let's talk about um, kind of where we're going today. Um, I'll do kind of a history lesson, um, maybe that's not the right word, but just some of the things that kind of got enterprises interested in containers and, and the idea of containers. Um, we'll talk about our clients, what we've seen them doing, how they've been getting into container land. Um, and then Will will talk to you guys about tooling, um, kind of where you might want to start. Um, and then we'll do some discussion talking about some of the lessons learned and the high level things that we've seen. Um, and we'll do hopefully some Q&A as well. I'd love to hear some feedback. So. Um, so kind of a quick survey, you know, it helps to get a sense of where people are on this path. So I mean, who's already, I mean, who's using cloud in some sense or another, whether it's OpenStack, whether it's Amazon, doesn't matter who's using some cloud. All right, cool. Okay, so lots of you. Everybody. Yeah, and which is to be expected, I think, but you know, it's always good to ask. Um, and who's doing kind of hybrid cloud stuff, whether it's public or private and multiple privates or whatever. Okay, so it's a little smaller, but not too much. Um, and so who's already doing containers or, or plans to very, very soon? Okay, so a few, okay. Um, so, so let's kind of, it helps to kind of gauge where we're going, I guess. But um, So we'll start with kind of a history lesson here, and these are just kind of general guideposts that got, got people thinking about the things that containers give you, right? So in the enterprise, the first, the first kind of guidepost is the enterprise data center and virtualization. So, you know, everyone's heard their boss or, or some executive say, you know, say the words, you know, data center footprint and cost savings around that. Um, and virtualization was kind of the first effort to solve this problem, right? Having bare metal servers for everything didn't make a ton of sense. You know, there's lots, lots of underutilization and that kind of thing. Um, so it just got us starting to think about packing our applications together, um, making sure we're managing those resources kind of the right way. Uh, the second kind of bullet point here is that open source has become, you know, pretty ubiquitous across the enterprise. Um, you know, whether it's the Linux Foundation or Apache, um, you're seeing people use open source all over the place, um, especially in data centers, you know, I mean, Linux is king. Um, and we've seen even, you know, in the OpenStack world, um, you know, people are going pretty heavy with OpenStack and, and private cloud and that kind of thing. Um, and so the, the next bullet point is, is public cloud. So that really kind of brought a change in the way that people started thinking about their data centers um, and thinking about what they're doing with their applications, right? So Amazon comes along 2006, um, starting with S3. Maybe that's not that interesting right out of the gate for enterprise, but EC2 comes out pretty, pretty quickly thereafter. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, why does it make sense to run my own infrastructure anymore? I can throw my VMs at someone else for pretty cheap cost. You know, maybe that's something I need to think about. But it required big changes to the way you're deploying your applications, the way you're writing your applications. So this gets into, you know, the whole pets versus cattle scenario that everybody's heard. Um, you know, th just thinking about those changes and how you're going to change your applications to make use of that environment, right? But public cloud's hard for enterprise. Um, so private cloud kind of comes along. And this is, of course, where OpenStack reigns supreme. Um, but OpenStack coming along and saying, okay, you know, all those cool things that I have in AWS, I can now have and host myself. Um, and that brings a lot of power to, to the enterprise, right? Um, 
especially when they've got you know concerns around security, around compliance. You know, if you've got HIPAA things you have to deal with or whatever, um, you know, private cloud makes a lot more sense. Um, kind of next to last bullet point here, um, hybrid cloud brings an idea. It kind of starts making you think towards containers a little bit, in that you're thinking about okay, I've got you know maybe a public cloud and a private cloud. I need to separate those workloads, but you know I need to orchestrate them all in one way, right? So I want something that kind of spans both of those um, and allows me to say, hey, deploy application, take care of it for me. And you say you start worrying about your application more than you start worrying about your infrastructure underneath it, um, which kind of makes you get pretty close to the way containers are working, right? But I mean, enterprises are slow to adopt. I mean, we see it all the time. Um, you know, we've still got clients that haven't done cloud yet, right? So of any sort. So we've got people that are, you know, have valid concerns completely about, you know, compliance and security and, and all of those things. Um, but a lot of times it's really not having the skills internally to, to get there, um, not having the automation processes as well, as far as deploying your applications and that kind of thing. Um, but in the last two bullet points are really most of the time, the real reason things don't happen, and that's process and culture, right? Um, enterprises are, you know, sometimes tough to get things done, um, and if you're not willing to upend some of that, it, it can be hard to uh, to get through clouds and you know to get into cloud and then get into containers. And so, kind of the last bullet point on this, you know, horrible history lesson: um, it, cloud native kind of comes into being as an idea, right? Uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation was a year or two ago kind of you know, founded. Um, it's, you know, its whole goal is to shepherd the idea that your applications are much better off to be broken into microservices and packaged in a container format. Um, and they're doing some of that by you know, doing a lot of community outreach. I mean, they're the ones that host KubeCon um, you know, and a few other kind of Linux, Linux conferences and that kind of thing. But you know, it's it's definitely helped reduce some of the hesitance, of knowing there's a government bo a governing body around these container formats and, and that kind of thing. So let's talk a little bit about our clients and, and kind of how we've worked with them to to get to containers. Um, you know, and if you work in an enterprise, you know, it, it's it can be a long road, but this is kind of how it's gone. So the, the first one is that virtualization paves the way, and, and I don't really mean virtualization as the first bullet point that I talked about in the history part, but I mean kind of cloud and cloud automation tends to pave the way for this kind of thing. Having some API that you can control your infrastructure with makes a huge difference in the way you can deploy your app applications. Um, the client that I've been working with pretty extensively for the past couple years, uh, we moved from basically they had one guy, you submit a ticket, he creates a VM, it takes two weeks to get it. Um, then they pass it off to an ops guy who follows a, you know, a run book of inst installing this, this software. Um, the run book's 100 pages long, right? So it takes him two weeks to get this thing installed. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, maybe he fat fingered something. Um, so, you know, having all of that stuff take that long is just a real pain. Um, and so being able to control your infrastructure with some API, whether that's OpenStack or something else, uh, makes a big difference in the way you deploy your applications, right? Uh, we help them build some tooling around, you know, creating VMs and baking images of Packer and all of that good stuff. Um, that two weeks came down to two hours. So, I mean, it's still a huge application and two hours takes a long time to deploy, but it's way faster than what they were seeing, right? So that was kind of their first step towards going full bore on containers. So. Once you kind of see that speed gain, I mean, that's a monster speed gain, even though it's still slow, right? Um, and so once you see that, it doesn't go unnoticed anywhere in the enterprise. We're all of a sudden deploying several times a week. Uh, we're moving faster, we're releasing more often. It's no longer this like quarterly process, like eh, we'll release kind of once a quarter and blah, blah, blah. You get rid of a lot of that stuff. And so all of a sudden you're moving really quickly. And you know, once you kind of start moving faster, you want to go even faster, right? So it's, it's just the speed is addicting. And we see our clients looking at their applications a second time and saying, you know, this is awesome. We've made a huge speed gain. But, you know, if we really broke this thing down a little bit, it, we could deploy this thing even faster. I mean, there's no reason for this application to be this complex. And I mean, we, you kind of see your clients discover the idea of microservices before we've even really talked about it, right? 
Um, and so that's, you know, that's kind of where, where we're going. And they, they look at microservices, they kind of start Googling around, and you can't see a blog post about microservices without seeing Docker involved in it, right? Um, and it, it makes sense, I mean, especially, you know, once you're talking about at, at, a, at a cluster level, you know, it makes sense to, to use containers as a packaging format. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not required, I guess, is the point. But we see our clients getting really comfortable with the idea of containers just because they want to break their, microserv make, break their applications into microservices. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of where containers come in, and they're just more of a secondary thing than just a primary focus. But, I mean, here's kind of why they're doing it. You know, the, the scalability is huge. Um, you know, being able to scale up in seconds versus minutes is pretty powerful, or especially hours, right? If you need another version of that application and you, all of a sudden it takes you two hours to create it, that's way too slow for you. Um, and, you know, another thing, kind of the second bullet point that we've seen our clients all of a sudden really be interested in getting out of any kind of vendor lock-in. You know, we've been paying company X a lot of money for a lot of years, and they haven't been giving us the speed gains that we really wanted. And so you see them looking towards open source even more than they were previously. Um, and you see them being okay with not going to a single vendor for the entirety of their application deployment pipeline. Um, so it's, you know, it's some pretty big changes there as well. So and that's all kind of to say that you know, a lot of times what we've seen with our clients is just that you've got to start with the initial kind of some speed gains and not the best you can do out of the gate. You've got to build the bridge before you can go over it, right? Um, you've got to see that initial speed gain in going to cloud. You've got to see the initial speed gain in making sure that your cloud automation is top notch before containers really start to make sense for a lot of our clients um, and before they're really interested in them. And so, Will, I'll turn it back over to you to talk a little bit about container tooling. All right, so here, I, I love this picture. It's, uh, it's from the, uh, the CNCF uh, GitHub site, I believe. Um, it's completely overwhelming, um, and I'm not even gonna bother getting into it too much, but the, the, the main takeaway here is that if you look at all the various categories of tooling, um, you know, from all the way from the infrastructure in the bottom to, you know, the application stuff on the top is there's a lot of choices. Um, it, it's all open stack, or sorry, open source. It's, uh, there's, there's closed source, uh, proprietary, pay, free. Uh, pretty much every category of software is available. And this is, this is all just like the, the, the tooling side of stuff here. So there's, case in point, there's, there's just a lot of choices out there right now. Um, so uh, we, we've been talking about this stuff for, for a long time. Um, over the last year or so, I think, uh, um, I guess about a, about a year ago when we first started you know, looking at it, um, the, the tooling was not there yet. It was, it was lacking, it was uh, not, not feature complete, it was unstable. Uh, it, was, it was really kind of rough and a lot of the early adapters, I think, um, kind of got bit by that a little bit. Um, over, over, over time, though, we've, we've really seen things um, uh, come along quite well. Uh, like, the, definitely the, the, the tooling's improved. Um, there's, there's definitely more choices there now. And it has, um, it's, it's definitely uh, come a long way, I think. Um, and, and the other point here is it's, it's moving, like, super fast. So it's, it's growing at an alarming rate. Um, uh, what, what we you know, the, the, the picture we, we saw at the last slide there, it's um, uh, all those are constantly changing. So it's, it's, it's something to, to keep tabs on. Um, and just the, kind of the stats here is that, like, like for example, the like Kubernetes project, um, in, in the last 30 days, uh, 677 code commits, that's like you know, 20 a day or so um, from quite a, quite a few contributors. Um, like Docker, not as many, but uh, still quite a bit, so you can see there's there's a lot of velocity here for sure. Um, so when it comes to deciding what exactly it is that you're looking for, uh, it's it's sort of a, a similar situation with many open source. Uh, is that it's it's not a single product, it's not a single vendor 
what you're going to find is that uh, in order to have a complete set of tooling, you're going to need to pick and choose from many sources. Um, and this is, this is both good and bad. Um, uh, so what we saw with OpenStack is um, and initially a lot of uh, vendors came out with like OpenStack distributions and we're not really seeing that quite as much in the container space. Um, if, like, if you look at the, the CoreOS logo there, um, how, how many people are familiar with CoreOS? Anybody? Okay, so some of you. Um, so it, it is a uh, container-specific distribution. Um, I, I feel inclined to mention Rancher OS too because it's a it, similar, similar thought, but um, it's uh, a slightly different design. Um, but so CoreOS is, is specifically for running containers. And, but that's not to say that you need to run CoreOS to run containers. Uh, you, can, you can choose any operating system that really makes sense to you. Um, but like starting from the bottom, you know, from your, you know, from your platform, you, it, it, it's really, you know, pick and choose every level of the stack here. Um, so, you know, choose your cloud platform or even bare metal if, it, you know, if you want. Um, then pick your, pick your OS. Um, registry is also one of those, those super critical um, components when you're doing containers. There's, uh, there's the, the official Docker solution, uh, Quay is by Coros, um, and there's also a number of third-party products out there, so some of, some of which you may, may already own, like Artifactory or Nexus. Um, so there, there's, there's a number of choices there. Um, Docker, as, as you may or may not have heard, is primarily a single, single node solution, so if you want any sort of scalability, you need absolutely need an orchestration layer like Kubernetes or Swarm. Uh, all the networking stuff is pluggable, uh, so whatever your networking needs are, I guarantee, you know, whether um, you want overlay, BGP, just L2 routing, something already exists for you there. And if it doesn't, you can do your own. That's the, that's the other nice thing. And for, for en the engine stuff, um, Docker is, is definitely the, the primary player in the market here. Uh, but Coros also has Rocket as well, um, so there, there's actually some competition, and, and I think that's really beneficial. So you can't really talk about containers without talking about open source, um, just because the, the, the entire container ecosystem is open standards. Um, most of the projects are open source. So in inevitably, if you're dealing with containers, you have to deal with open source. Uh, that's not as big of an issue today as it was maybe five or 10 years ago, I think. Um, I mean, if you look at you know, the open source penetration into the market, you're gonna see you know, with operating systems, databases, and definitely um, tools. Um, the majority of tools, at least I've tend to adopt it in, in the recent time is they're all open source. Um, and it's, you know, they're, there's some of the best ones out there for sure. Um, according to this Black Duck study, which is kind of interesting, 65% uh, of the companies they talk to are actually contributing to open source projects, which is, um, I was actually kind of surprised at that number. It's uh, um, definitely a, a growing number. Um, and also, one in three companies have dedicated employees to open source projects, and that's that's kind of huge when you think about it. Because, um, like, an entire employee is is you know not actually doing anything for the company other than giving away free software. Um, but if you look at the benefits, that's it's actually quite huge for any company. Um, Having your company's name associated with an open source project, it gives you legitimacy in the industry. Uh, it attracts uh, other employees as well. And it also, um, yeah, it just gives you exposure where you might otherwise not have any. So that's, that's kind of invaluable um, if, if you look at it from that angle. And, um, it's just uh, along with that survey, 76% said um, they're looking at integrating containers, and about uh, a third of them were already looking, uh, using them for testing or development, where, which are actually two of the probably the easiest adoption 
places. So, getting started. Um, uh, since, since the majority of you have already uh, adopted cloud or uh, considering it um, getting on cloud, uh, you've, you've already sort of taken that first step, um, at least away from the, uh, the, 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 the battled world of uh, manual steps and virtualization. Uh, hopefully nobody's doing the meet cloud approach. That's, that's never beneficial. Um, so uh, one of the first questions is, what, what's, what's your business? Um, how, how do you make money? Um, and some people, they, they do their own apps. Some people consume other people's apps. Um, and and how, how is this all tied to your, your line of business? Um, so obviously, uh, if you're building your own applications, you should seriously be considering containers. Um, and even if you're just consuming other people's applications, um, it might be time to start considering containers as well. Um, so recently, um, a project we're working on uh, actually made a purchase from, what was it Oracle? Cisco. Oh, sorry, Cisco. <laughs> and, and the actual software was delivered as a, um, as, a, as a container specified to run on Kubernetes. So uh, what we have here is an example of a major vendor actually starting to distribute its software as a container. And I, I think we're definitely going to see that this uh, trend continue as uh, um, you know, containers gain, gain popularity here. And, and, and the, the take home is that you know, containers are not a future technology. Um, the containers as a concept have been around probably since the God, you know, 90s. Um, very long time. Uh, it, it's been in Linux for a long time. and. Um, so it's, it's definitely a, a vetted technology. It's you know, something that works. And it's, it's, it's here today. People are using containers today. And, and they're, they're, they're benefiting from them today as well. And so a lot of times, in the next question people ask is, OK, are, are VMs useless? Um, short term, the answer is absolutely. Um, you still need VMs. And long term, uh, I definitely think VMs are not going to go away. Um, I, I think they're going to become less important than they are for sure. Uh, but uh, long term, I, I think there's, there's, a, there's a firm place for, for bare metal, for virtual machines, and for containers in, in the entire stack. And part, part of the challenge with all this adoption is going to be dealing with the various types of virtualization. Um, if you look at the numbers, um, converting a virtual machine application to a container has a cost. And, and, and it really just comes down to, is it worth the, the conversion process? Is it worth the development time? Is it worth, or is it better just to leave something standing there and just uh, don't touch it? Um, so you, you really kind of have to take you know, everything on a case by case consideration. So a lot of people go, okay, like, awesome, how do we do this? Um, and one of the things we always say is, you know, take a small problem and solve it. Um, so our, our example here is um, hardware. So what we've seen in, in a lot of uh, companies is hardware is always not there. Or people need hardware, they need resources, and they're unavailable. Um, especially with developers. Developers need to test things. They need extra resources. Um, and, and it's a challenge to get them. And when they do get them, they, they tend to hoard them because it's, um, you know, if, if they give them back, it might take, you know, weeks or months to, to re get them again. Um, so in, in this situation, um, actually, uh, one of our clients we talked to, they had close to 80% idle time on most of their infrastructure sim simply for this reason. Um, so it, it, this is a fairly common problem. We, we've seen a number of places. And it's, it's a great, great, um, easy uh, fix for containers. Um, so once, once developers can start running containers on their desktops, um, what they can find is that they can actually do a lot more with the resources they already have. 
Um, and if, if they start actually returning some of the, uh, the spare hardware and, and start creating like Kubernetes clusters, um, you can actually start running your, your infrastructure a lot more dense. You can, you can pile stuff up a lot deeper. And um, you can actually do a lot more with what you already have. And, and this, is, um, this is just like one, one example. Um, there, there's obviously a number of ways you can do this. But it, it also gets people um, sort of working with the technology. And what we've, what we've actually seen is that developers are really excited to start using containers. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of benefits there. Um, so when, when people are excited to use stuff, it's, it's definitely a lot easier. So what, one, one other thing we're going to get into here a little bit is um, um, DevOps, because it's, it's kind of all related. Uh, we, we talk about it a lot here. Um, and that, that people, people tend to jump into technology and, and make, make a lot of mistakes. Um, they, they pick the biggest project that, that's, you know, something high level, gets a lot of visibility, they, they throw a lot of bodies at it, and things just get really messy really quick. Um, I've, I'm always of the firm opinion you start small and you iterate. Um, that, that definitely holds true here. Uh, so you, you, you want to start with uh, something that, that's actually um, like, like not mission critical, external facing, maybe an internal tool that you know, people won't be too upset if it's down for an hour or so. Um, but yeah, experiment with something small. Uh, build your skills. Um, actually, running containers involves a lot of new skills that you probably don't have yet if you're just you know, coming from a virtualization world. Um, and, and you want to give people time to actually like, grow these skills before you, you start pushing forward too deep. Um, otherwise, you're going to move a bunch of applications, stuff's going to start breaking, and you're not going to be able to fix it. And it's just going to be a gigantic mess. Um, so it's kind of, kind of keeping with the DevOps theme here. Um, uh, most organizations don't communicate from business to ops in, in any sort of coherent manner. Um, what you have is silos that are primarily communicating via ticketing systems or other, other you know, various software systems, but they don't actually directly interact with each other much. And and so actually, uh, communicating messages um, from, from one end to the other can be very challenging. Um, and and this, this kind of goes back to the, the technology is easy, um, people are hard. Um, so, so getting um, people lined up, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, so, so adopting Dev, DevOps is um, a real, real change for the way people actually work. Um, you know, getting, getting stuff going there. Um, and it requires actually a pretty big change um, for most people in, in the way they work. Uh, one of the way, um, common ways to view this is the four pillars. Um, is sort of the, the four primary ways this all interacts with each other. Um, so you have the, the culture, um, the way all your, all your various employees interact with each other. Um, then there, there's the processes that you have implemented, um, either manual, automated, or whatever. Um, and then, then your people's, their skills, and then obviously the, the technologies that you use. Um, and and this, this, this kind of demonstrates the, uh, the importance of all, having all four of those at the same time. Um, so obviously once um, the, 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 the top, top line here is the, uh, the, the ideal situation, uh, if you remove culture, um, people, people get um, opposed to having changes. Um, if, if you don't have any process, uh, people just kind of run around with their heads cut off. They, it's, uh, there's never a, a really clear direction as to what you're supposed to be doing at any given time. Um, so for, for the people there, 
Um, if you don't have the right skills, uh, if you don't have time to de develop or nurture those skills, yeah, it's, it's really going to be hard to actually make a lot of um, progress well. And, and likewise with technology, if, if, you're, if you're not actually using technology people want to or actually solves your problem well, you know, there's, there's just going to be frustration there. And, and so I, I guess sort of the bottom line here, um, like the, uh, the, the primary point here is um, you, you are, if you're not ready for containers, you, you really should be at this point. Um, a, a lot of people say, you know, this, this, this isn't relevant to me today, and, and that might be true, um, but it, it probably will be in the near future here. So th thank you very much. Um, I guess open this up for questions. There's, there's mics as well, if anybody wants, wants to ask a question. Cool, easy enough, all right. Uh, this mic. Oh, okay, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, the case for using virtualization and containers? Um, so are you meaning like uh, at the same time, uh, layered, or, or what? You know, so one of the things that I've kind of noticed throughout this week is that a lot of people are talking about, you know, using, it seems like, I could be wrong, but they, they, they're talking about like running like say containers on top of OpenStack or like why, why, why do you want that? It seems like just multiple layers of, chronic, of, of complexity. And I just wanted to know what, uh, what your viewpoint was. So, so, I mean, if you're talking about running Kubernetes on top of OpenStack, a lot of times it's really just because it's easier to get started that way. Um, it's easier to scratch it, you know, to scratch pad all these, you know, Kubernetes cluster running in VMs than it is to try to get allocated bare metal and all that stuff. Um, you know, and, and our clients, I mean, you know, the client I'm working with, they're doing Kubernetes in Amazon um, for a similar reason, right? But the end goal will probably be bare metal Kubernetes. Um, once that, once it's proven and realized that, you know, it, it makes sense to, to run things this way, um, it will, will probably start including more bare metal nodes in our clusters and that kind of thing. So it's mostly for like proof of concept, but then for production. Yeah, I mean, cer certainly like, I mean, if you're using Google, Google Container Engine, I mean, it's VMs as well under the hood, but, um, you know, like I said, it's just easier to kind of get started that way and, and iterate that way. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.